that song. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Singing praises to you, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is one of those times when I think about some of the little things that we used to say as kids near the end of the year. And as I stand up here on the last Sunday of the year, I'm not going to preach to you anymore this year. After today. That's all right. <laughs> this is the final sermon in the three sermon series. Yes, yes. The first one was Do You Know What I Know? Last Sunday was Do You Hear? what I hear. And this Sunday is Do You See What I See? And our scripture as we read from Luke chapter 2 verses 10 through 16 talking about the message that the angels heard. But after you hear something, they had to go and see something. I want to look at this today as we bring it all together. What happens after you hear and after you know. And look at how you must see. Because after you hear something, and after you know something, there is a way that you must see things. I remember when I was in college, There was a song that used to come on. I believe it was a song from a musical. I can see clearly now that the rain has come. There's a whole lot of things that we can think of that we see. I remember once a textbook that I had in school that I believe it was a social studies book and there were things called optical illusions. And every now and then I get a couple of those on Facebook. The most recent one I got was a picture of a horse and somebody asked do you see the bunny rabbit you see that one and then there was a one I got where someone asked do you see the picture of the lady standing by the lake the one I remember from high school was a picture of a vase. But if you look closely, it wasn't just a picture of a vase, it was a picture of two faces facing each other. Y'all remember that? Y'all must have had the same textbook. <laughs> and then there were other pictures that if you looked at it a certain way and it would ask you, are these pictures 
the same signs? Are they symmetrical? And some people could look at it and just couldn't see it. And other people could look at it and see it right away. It all depends on how you look at things. Sometimes when you look at certain colors, and I remember when I took the test for my CDL, commercial driver's license, and they put up this picture and they said, with all these little different colors, and they said, what numbers do you see in it? And right away I said, oh, I said, in that one there's number 26, and that one there's number 52, and that one there's number 8. But for somebody who's colorblind, Lord, help them. Because they aren't able to differentiate and see the numbers in the different colors, which means you probably are not going to get a CDL because if you can't determine the colors, they're not going to give you a CDL because you need to be able to determine colors. Some people can get a driver's license because they can see the light and they can determine whether it's the top light, the middle light, or the bottom light. Well, that's important because you know if it's the top light, then the light's red. If it's the middle light, it's caution. If it's the bottom light, it's green. But if you're trying to get a driver's license to hold the lives of people in your, up in your hands, they're not going to give you one just based on that. You have to be able to see it in a different way. So you see, it even translates into the spiritual realm. You can't just see things in one way. When you come to Christ, you have to be able to see things in a spiritual way, and you have to be able to see things with God's eyesight. When you can see things in, with God's vision, things begin to change. Now, God put a lot of preparation into the plan of salvation. I could go back to the very beginning and paint you the story of your plan of salvation that goes back to the Garden of Eden. You see, even when he made man in the garden, making man in his own image, making man with the capability of thinking like God, being able to be a free agent and think like God, that meant that God gave man the option of making choices. He could have made him like he made the other animals. He could have programmed man to praise God just like he gave the birds no option and they chirp and sing praises to God as soon as the sun comes up. He could have programmed man to fly like geese in formation. He could have programmed man to on, on cue raise holy hands the moment the sun rose in the morning. He could have programmed man like the angels to fly around like the seraphims crying holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But that would not have done God the justice of our loving him from the depths of our heart. It would have been just an automated program. He wanted someone that would be able to fellowship with him and interact with him and communicate with him the way that would be meaningful in what we now call fellowship. Something that would enhance the spirit of God the way 
it enhances our spirit. Something that boosts his spirit the way we boost one another when we interact with one another and encourage one another. That's why God breathed into us something that the animals didn't get, and that is the breath of life. But he gave man a little test. The very first tithe, all those trees he put in the garden, all those trees were just like other trees. And I'll go to my grave believing that there was nothing different about the tree in the center of the garden than some of those other trees that they ate of because there is no way Eve could have looked at a tree and seen that it was good to eat unless she had had that fruit somewhere else before. You can't look at a cherry and know that a cherry is good to eat unless you've had a cherry before. You can't look at a piece of steak and know that a piece of steak is good to eat. Now, I don't eat much beef anymore. I just don't do beef. You can't look at a turkey burger and know that a turkey burger is good to eat unless you've had turkey burgers somewhere else before. Somebody say, oh my God, I can't go there. Hey, beef just don't set too well in my stomach anymore because I don't eat it much anymore. You had to have had it somewhere else before. All right, well, let me, let me break it down so the kids can understand it. You can't look at vanilla ice cream and know that vanilla ice cream is good to eat. Oh, I got, I got a witness on the front row, Brother Kenny. Uh, but, ooh. I don't, do, I don't do ice cream with nuts in it, but okay. If that floats your boat, you can't look at butter pecan ice cream and know that it's good to eat unless you've had butter pecan ice cream somewhere else before. So Eve knew that that fruit was good to eat. I think I made my point now. Because she'd had it on another tree. The thing was, She'd eaten it somewhere else, but God said, don't touch that one because that one I'm reserving for me. So it wasn't enough she could have gotten it somewhere else, and he gave that one a special name. That's mine. I'm calling it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You eat that one because it belongs to me, you'll die. But instead of killing them, he killed something else in their place. Yeah. He made a plan because he still loved them so much he wanted the fellowship with them. And they pass it on to their sons. One son could see it and the other one couldn't. Because if Cain had seen what God was trying to show him, he would not have killed his brother. He would have gone to his brother and he would have said, I see you have some animals. Can I buy one of your animals without blemish to offer a sacrifice to God that'll please him? Things might have been a little different different for Cain. Can you see how different it would have been for him? And because he killed his brother, he would see after the fact what his actions had caused. Because now the world would see he's got a mark on him for the rest of his life. He's marked as a murderer. The world's going to want to kill him for killing his brother. But yet if they do, it will cause a curse on them. But every generation after that would understand 
that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. God, you were trying all along to prepare the way. And for 42 generations, you prepared the way. And then one day, you send a message to a group of shepherds, keeping watch over a flock in a field. And you tell them, I've got good news. And it's going to be a blessing to the world. A Savior is born. It's going to save the world from sin. And then you send them the message by singing it to them in a song. And then when you sing the song to it, they were so moved, they didn't just say, oh, that was nice. We heard a good song. They decided after hearing it, they internalized it. And the first place they saw what the Lord was telling them, you have to first see it in your spirit. So when they heard the message, the message took sight down in their soul. You see, when you hear something from God, it's got to translate to where you can see it in your spirit. And then you want to visualize it. So they said to one another, they all said, now, let's go. I, I, I see it in my soul. I want to see it in with my own eyes. I want to lay eyes on it for myself. I don't just want to see it in my spirit. They could have sat there and said, oh, I see what this must, must look like. They could have just saw it as a blessed hope that one day we'll see him, you know, in the future. No, I want to go see it right now. He said, this day it's happened. I want to see it today. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. I don't want to wait several months until the wise men go see him in a, in a house. I want to go to the stable right now. It says, you'll find him in Bethlehem in a stable. I want to go right now. I see it in my spirit. I got to go find that stable I'm going right now while the song is still ringing in my soul that the angel say I'm going now let's go if you go don't go with me I'm going by myself but they left their flock and they went right then what about Anna the prophetess She had to hold a baby. She laid eyes on him herself. She had to see it, see him for herself. But here these shepherds, they saw him. But it wasn't so much they saw him and then just walk away. You see, some people see things and then it's just out of sight, mm -hmm. out, of out of mind. I remember one time a friend of mine telling me they had seen the president. And his daughter said, I just want to shake the president's hand. And when she got to shake the president's hand. She says, oh, I'm never going to wash my hand again. And her daddy said, baby, that's not the point. You've shaken the hand of the president. He's looked in your face. You've seen him. He looks like you. Now, what are you going to do with that in your life? Right. Now that you see what you can do, what are you going to let that do for you? What do you see now for you in your future? That's what you should not wash away. What can you do now in your future? What do you see for you because of this? What the shepherds saw was a savior. The wise men 
would see in the house a savior. And they would bring gifts to a savior, unusual gifts, a gifts of gold, a gift that you'd bring for a king. But the frankincense and the myrrh, those were spices that were used for burial. You bring gold for a king, an infant king, and then you turn around at the same time and you bring embalming spices for a baby. I think I see what you see. I think I see what you see that maybe you didn't see at the time, but I see now as I look back because I see the picture that you couldn't see then. I see what God is showing all of us, that this was the one that John saw coming down that he would baptize, that he would say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one that Isaiah saw a thousand years before he was born that he would say he is wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace is upon him and with his stripes we are healed. This is the one that I see that is hanging, it's hanging one day upon a cross that would one day be covered with his own blood that they would carry the spices on the third day to the grave to finish the burial process but he's not there because he's risen from the dead I see something that they couldn't see then I see now him sitting upon his throne upon his father's throne in glory and splendor crowned in righteousness crowned one day in many crowns one of those crowns of many crowns is the crown that he would place upon your head in my head for being overcomers and then when the, the trumpet sounds and the four and twenty elders bow down we would take those crowns apart off of our heads and gladly lay them down upon their his at his feet to be placed upon his head. That's what I see. Do you see what I see? I see him now taking not away only my sin, but I see him taking away my troubles. I see him taking away your troubles. I see him taking away your sorrows and my sorrows and your pain and my pain. I see him taking away the suffering of the world. I see what nobody could see then. Why? Because as I look back, I can look back over my life and think of all the things that he's brought me through. I can look ahead now and I can look back at the track record and I say, well, if he's brought us through this, he's brought us through this, he's brought us through this, he's brought us through that. As I look ahead and look back, I can compare and say, well, if he brought us through that, what's ahead ain't nothing for him. He'll carry us through what's yet to come. I can see what he wants me to see. Do you see what I see? Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the hearts of men. The things that God has in store for us. Do you see what I see? I see there's blessings yet unfolded for all of his people who yet hope for his appearing. Why? Because of the great love he had for all of us. Oh yeah. The shepherds could have said, yeah, I've been there, done that. But I bet you, they said after that, I've seen him and I'll never forget it. I'm not going to erase this from my mind. 
the shepherd spoke to me and I'll see it in my heart till the day I die. I've laid eyes on my king and I will never, ever erase the fact that I've seen my savior. And though I've never laid eyes on him physically, I see him every day. Every day I have the miracle of waking up in the morning. I see him. Every day when I can smile through whatever pain I face, I see him. Every day that a tear gets wiped from your face and my face, I see him. Every time Satan gets defeated in our lives, I see him. Every time one of us gets a victory and Satan gets kicked in his teeth, I see him. And one day when the last trump shall sound on that great get nut morning, you know what? I shall see him. And the one thing I like is he shall see me. Is there one this morning? Songwriter says, oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory. Just let me lift my voice. Cares all past. Home at last. Ever to rejoice. Is there one?